Happy to be with you here, man. I actually uh, just started watching your content. You started coming up on my feed, and I'm like, I really like what this guy's talking about. I love actually the way your videos are formatted in such a professional setting. I said, you know, I usually rush when I record mine. I'm like, maybe I should do them a little more like Matt Easton down there. It always oh. has a beautiful background. You're always suited up, you know? Trying. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, of course, man. Yeah. So, uh, thanks for coming out and speaking today, man. Thanks for having me, man. It's an, it's an honor. It's a privilege. It's so nice. You know, you know, they're out there, but sometimes it's hard to find other people that are interested in getting better, interested in sales and, and understand that that that's a huge piece to every single business. I mean, far too often, especially now today, uh, and it, it breaks my heart, but people come in, you know, you get venture capital, whatever it is, you start a company, they'll spend 27 days and $300 million figuring out what color beige the logo should be. And nobody talks about how are we going to sell this? What are we going to say? When are we going to say it? Um, it just gets glossed over. And I, and I see companies go out of business left and right that had everything set up. They just didn't do that. There is nothing in this world that you don't have to sell. You got to sell everything, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's an important piece of the puzzle. 100%. And I'm, I, I think I differ a little in that. I think people are starting to see it more and more now. They're starting to focus on it more and more now, mm. especially because all this content that's out there and what's going on. There's a lot of free nuggets like people like me and you give daily on a daily basis, right? We give people right. the little nuggets of what they could do. It's uh, what I've been finding is not only do I do the sales, but I do the leadership as well, because it's all about accountability and consistency. You know, I have leaders that say they call me in a month or two. Hey, this stopped working. Well, did you do it every single week at this time and execute on the play? No. So what I've been doing is I've been trying to automate things for leaders and make them easier because I find like the biggest thing I've been finding with leaders is they have so much on their plate that they let go of the traditions and the things they're trying to build because, Oh no, this is more important right now. Know that yeah. one sale might not be more important right now. As a matter of fact, this training long-term might be more important for your organization than that one sale. Are you hopping on that phone call? For example? Um, yeah. And, and I mean, I'm curious to get your opinion on this, but I think too, when they say there's a lot on their plate, I'll push back on that with a lot of leaders because they spend a lot of time in a lot of meetings uh, that don't necessarily have even a fraction of the impact if they had just checked in with their team on a regular basis. And instead of, you know, those check-ins, cause I, I came from the corporate world. I, I, I did the whole ranks from starting out, you know, selling payroll for companies like ADP to all the way to, you know, VP of sales and running the American customer satisfaction index for a number of years. A lot of those leadership meetings, it's just, you know, let's talk about what's supposed to come in, but nobody's talking about, you know, what are you trying to do? How are you executing? How can I help you? Right? Like if the NFL, if NFL football teams managed their practices, the way that some of these leaders, and again, I'm not trying to be negative on leaders, but manage their meetings, um, you know, they never even get a first down, much less win a game. hundred percent. I think a lot of their time goes, I call it, you know, like I could cut my grass. I could clean my pool. I could clean my house. I could do the laundry. I don't do those things because I'd rather value my time in areas where I'm needed. Right. So I'd rather pay the money to do that. So yeah, a lot of the, these leaders spend their time where it's not valued and they're not spending it on the bigger picture, but yeah. we're about to, so we, we're jumping straight into business, which I love, but <laughs> I don't even know you on a personal level. You know, this is the first time we've interacted. Could you tell me about yourself? I know you just sprinkled it in a little bit, but who is Matt Easton and how did this start? Yeah, I was looking for it. Usually I have it on my desk, man. It's like my most valuable thing. I can't find it now. Too bad. I had this little green uh, green Porsche. Don't have that. I got the GT40. That's what I'm going to buy. You get two oh, right sales guys on a call and they, they get straight to business right away. With right. The, with so the who, appetizers. Yeah, I've got these. I've got this little. Uh, green. I, I wish I had it here to show it to you. It's old. It's worn out. Uh, but this little green matchbox car, and I think it, it's a 1979 Porsche Turbo, and it signifies kind of who who Matt Easton is, because that's the one artifact that I've had um, all but seven years of my life. In that I Matt Easton is a guy that where where I I come from, I guess you could call it humble beginnings. I was very fortunate uh, in that 
things weren't really set up for me very well when I was a kid as a child of a single mom. My dad's great, but technically like for the record, he's my stepdad. He didn't come around till I think I was 10, 10 or 11 years old. Um, but at single mom, she was making $4,000 a year. You heard that right. $4,000 a year. Now, granted that was 1980, but that's still not a lot of money today. Uh, mm -hmm. trying to raise two boys. I had, um, you know, I guess they could call it, I was diagnosed with learning disabilities. They figured it out later on that I just had some visual neurological problems that were pretty easy to fix. Um, but at that time, when I was eight years old, learning disabled, and by the way, back then, if you're learning disabled, especially if you're a kid from poverty, they just put you in the room uh, with the other kids that stabbed each other. <laughs> that was yeah, yeah. that was that was special education back then yeah, so i got my, somehow my got craziest friends were in the special education right class. yeah exactly not exactly. because they had a learning disorder because they were just they stab people yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that's the group i was with when i was yeah, eight. yeah um so uh, things were tough things were rough the expectations of me were very low um you know and honestly and, and it's funny I can recall all of this very well being eight years old thinking, man, maybe I'll just work at a gas station one day. Well, and, and I wish I had the car, darn it. Um, I was playing with the car in the mud because we didn't have grass because we didn't have any money. Uh, and sure as heck, the actual car, that's why I've saved it my whole life. 79 Porsche Turbo in 1980, the car was four months old, comes zooming down the street. And I did what any unsupervised poor kid would do when the Porsche Matchbox car they're playing with rolls down the street. I ran after it. Um, and I kind of had an idea what it, where it was going. There was one person in our neighborhood with some semblance of money. His name was John Carroll. He was an attorney. He also had Parkinson's disease. Uh, and I it, the car parked in front of his house. I assumed it was his. It wasn't. I waited. The guy came out wearing a suit. And I said what any poor eight-year-old kid would say, Mr. Is this your car? Right? Yes, it is. Next question. What do you do? And he's like, I, I sell computers for a company called Texas Instruments. Now here's was the life-changing moment for me. I said, wow, those must be good computers. And this guy was honest to me. He goes, and he, he, he forgive my language. I'm going to quote his exact words. No kid. It's a piece of shit. And I was like, whoa, first of all, an adult was talking to me and using language. I thought that was so cool when I was eight years old. And he's like, so I sell a computer called the TI-99-4. I, I, I looked it up later on in my life. Texas Instruments had a problem with this computer from the get-go. He's like, but here's the thing, I'm in sales. And so, and he had, he had a tonality like that. So he, he goes, I, I realize everything that's bad has good parts to it. And the really nice thing about this computer kid is it's got this calendar application that works really, really well. And what I've discovered is people like doctors and attorneys who need to come home after a hard day's work, well, they still have office work. They can have this computer at their house and fill in their records. And he goes, do you know who lives here? I said, yeah, Mr. Carroll. He goes, do you know what he does? I go, yeah, he's an attorney. He goes, well, do you know anything else about him? And I said, the, the, I was eight years old, right? I said, the twitching? He goes, yeah, he's got Parkinson's. And he needs to take his medication in the afternoons, but he's not legally allowed to drive after he's taken that medication. What, what we just did for him today is give him the ability to meet with clients up until three o'clock, drive home, take his medication, and then put all of his notes from those meetings while he's at home. And it changed his life. And by the way, computer costs $500. I just made a $125 commission. This is the fourth one I've sold today. And I was like, before then I thought sales was all about being slick and manipulative and pushy. And just to double down on everything that I was like, wow, I was inspired by this guy. When I saw Mr. Carroll a few weeks later, I said, oh man, I heard you got a new computer. He was like, changed my life, kid, changed my life. So here it was, supposedly the worst computer of POS Right. And in 1980 money to 500 bucks was like two, 2,500, three grand. Mm -hmm. And this person had figured out the silver lining with that. And not, not only was he making sales at the rate of four a day. I mean, the guy was making 400 bucks a day driving around in a Porsche, which I thought was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. But the people that he worked with were coming back and going, Greatest guy I ever met. Now, I still don't, to this day, I wonder if he's still alive. I wish I knew that guy's name. I don't. The other cool thing that he did for me is I said, well, I could never do that. He's like, 
Of course you did. Could the fact that you ran over here and started a conversation with me, he goes, you could make any amount of money you want. I said, well, no, I'm learning disabled. He's like, come on, man. And I was like, no, I really am. I can't even spell. He went into the front because the engine in that car's in the back opened up. And still one of these days, one of the first things I did when I started getting money is I bought a, I, mine was a 55. I bought a 55 poor speedster, but he opened up the front and he pulled out a speak and spell, which was like the dope toy back then. It was like $70 toy. Like there's no way I, my mom would ever be able to, he hands it to me. And I like a smart ass. I was very grateful. I'm like, Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And it just came out of my mouth. I go, my older brother's going to, he's going to beat me up and take it because my older brother would. Right. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> he, he, was, he was a tough guy. He ended up being a very decorated Marine, but I was terrified of him. Goes back into the trunk, grabs another one, hands me two freaking speaking spells. And he's like, promise me this, right? Don't ever say anything bad about yourself ever again. And I was like, Psh. from that moment on, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. I started businesses. I had uh, by 16, I had quality publishing, which some people may or may not know of. Like back in the day in the 90s and late 80s, if you went into the back of a magazine like Car and Driver or Playboy or anything like that, they had these government auction guides. That was me. Uh, made the government auction guides, was sending them out of Boulder, Colorado, doing mail order there. Um, had a number of different businesses and it just kind of took off from there. And then after college, sold the apparel company that we had uh, and got into kind of corporate sales. And really, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, Ace, the second epiphany that I had and no disrespect to the big companies, they spent millions of dollars training me. But the second epiphany that I had was when I went through those trainings and I don't want to name names. I'm sure you've been through some of these trainings. They're all still around, right? There's one with like initials and you're in the situation phase and the knees went through all of that, right? Got my black belt and all of that. And by the way, I dominated everybody every time we role played and that was great. But what I found was when I went through that traditional corporate sales training, my sales actually slowed down. And there was some good stuff in there that I pulled out. But for the most part, when I slowed down and did what I had started doing at eight years old, right? Hey, Ace, what's most important to you? Why is that, right? What's your biggest reason for needing this, right? Can you walk me through a specific example of what you guys are doing today? Instead of going, okay, in this phase, I'm going to be asking you da, 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 da. And then we're going to sit through a 40 minute demo, whether you want to see it or not. So that's where, um, when I left the corporate world, I owned some marketing companies, but always loved the sales training. That's where we grab it. That's where we end up where we're at now is, uh, you know, very, very effective, very easy to learn sales training. Wow. That's a crazy story, man eight years old. And you remember that. I don't think I remember anything when I was eight years old. I remember everything about it because it was one of those magical moments where, you know, sometimes Ace, your worst days can end up being your best days. And I, I don't want to like overstate it and say, I was like, man, I have no reason to live. Yeah. But when you're eight years old and there's no food in the refrigerator and you have this thing, it was called the government hot lunch program as a cardboard card. And I remember because it, it was summertime and I freaking hated summertime because in the summer I couldn't get a hot lunch at school. Right. So summers were hungry times for me, right. Hot and hungry. That's how I would describe my summers, hot and hungry. Um, and I just remember sitting there playing with that damn car going like thinking, man, as an eight year, this she, life's got to be more fun than this. And then the freaking car drove by. I don't know. I don't want to get into religion or anything. Whatever you guys believe, the force, Allah, God, <laughs> whatever it is, whatever your jam is, that's what, that's sprinkle a little bit of the force and God and Allah and whoever else yeah, all, hope, all rolled uh, into one came driving by my house yeah. in a green 79 turbo. I hope that guy listens to this podcast and he's out there somewhere. I sure he's hope he out is. Here. Yeah. You know, that dude was so cool and so smooth. He probably doesn't, he probably doesn't even know that he changed your life, but that's doesn't even you know, know. Right. That's and phenomenal. that's, it's funny. Cause that's why like sales training, I, I really like jujitsu. I like fighting, but then also cars. Um, and my wife is super, my wife's ahead of everything. My wife, my kids, then sales training, then jujitsu, then cars. But I think my wife gets it. She doesn't give me a hard time when I blow, you know, a bunch of money on cars. Cause I think part of me 
does that because like, I'll stop, like I'll be rolling in my Mulsanne or something. And some kid will be out there. Now they take pictures and I'm like, man, want to sit in it? And I'll, I'll kids, no problem. You want to sit in the Porsche? No problem. You want to start it up? Go for it. Cause I'm, I think I'm always just trying to make that connection that that guy had with me. Um, and maybe, yeah, I don't know, probably, I'll pay you for therapy. Your, it's probably part of your ultimate purpose. You know, it's, it's really yeah. 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 Maybe that's why I love cars so much now. I don't know, but um, you can send me the ther therapy bill later. <laughs> I was talking about that yesterday, actually, with a few friends, you know, about some people say like, you know, save your money, don't spend it, uh, be smart with it, materialistic mm -hmm. things. But then we were talking about like, the reason why I work hard is because I look around here and I see a beautiful <clears throat> pool and a beautiful house and my dream car. And like, when you yeah. drive that car, I think that like that raises your standards as a human being. And, you know, sometimes that additional positive pressure is good. I, I don't hate the fact that I have higher bills and higher monthly expenses. Now that actually yeah. makes me work twice as hard because I know that I can't afford to fail, you yeah. know, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I will say this too, and I'm sure you probably feel the same way. My wife and I have had this conversation multiple times, especially recently with people that we know in our circles, you know, it's not an easy time. It's a recession. There's some people that are really suffering, but one of the things that I've always believed that I'm sure you probably would agree with this statement when times get tough, I think initially most people think of how can I reduce expensive expenses? And I will tell you, you can only reduce expenses down to zero. And as somebody that was born essentially with zero, I don't want to make it seem that bad, but there was $4,000 a year to go around, right? I learned real quickly that it's much easier. I'm just going to tell the, the, the viewers, the listeners, the, the folks out there, come and take it for what you want. I'm just going to say it is much easier for you to listen to guys like Ace and figure out a way to make another $2,000, $5,000, $20,000, $100,000 a month than it is for you to save your way or to cut expenses out of whatever mess you're in right now. The easy, the shortest line, for, if you're unhappy and uncomfortable right now, the shortest way for you to get to a state of prosperity and, and comfort is just figure out how to, how to be more effective and be more skillful. And by the way, sales, even if you're not in sales, we all are. Doctors have to sell patients on taking their medication. You mm -hmm. have to sell somebody on promoting you at work. And for the people, because I do get this sometimes in jujitsu, right? Because you meet all types of people when you're fighting, right? And, and there's those people that ride their bikes to school. And every now and then somebody will leave some little snarky comment like, yeah, you drove $400,000 car here. Money's not everything. And I'm like, who said it was, pal? right? Um, they say it a lot less now that I have a black belt because they really can't say that. They'd have to say, professor, money's not everything. But I'm like, okay, well, what are you into? Well, I'm really into helping people. Awesome. That's freaking fantastic. Can't really help anybody if you have $4.37 in your bank account, right? So I'm the same way as you. I, I, by the way, I got, I write my goals down every day. Boom. There's my little sheet. Look at that house that I'm I want to get right there, right? Like I want the pool. I want things around that I mean, that inspire me. But even if what inspired me was helping other people, okay, it's really hard to do that if I don't have any money. So um, stop, if you don't have money, stop hating on it. You, you can give it away. Ace ain't going to stop you from giving it away. I'm not going to stop you from giving it away. I mean, he, you cause what you think, right? I mean, yeah. you're going to attract more poverty into your life if you're always hating on money. And Absolutely. It's and you're not going to help I had, anybody. I had a similar upbringing. Uh, like, I'm not even going to go into the details, but it's almost uh, identical to your story. You know, hard beginnings. Uh, my dad got me a disco ball for Christmas. That was my tree. We couldn't <laughs> afford a tree. You know, yep. 99 disco ball, CVS, worked gas station, subway, quit sports at school so I could help my parents. Like, and I believe all of that built us to be the pr people we are today. So, I mean, 100%. you know, people, people out there that, hey, don't understand. Like, hey, you know, I retired my parents. I've, 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 accomplish my family's dreams. I'm leaving a legacy. I work my ass off. I'm sure you work your ass off to help yeah. other people accomplish their goals more than we care about accomplishing our goals. When I go on vacations, I'm working. I'm Me in the, my plane. I'm working in the hotel. I'm working. I'm recording content. Like this isn't the life I chose. This is the life that I was bound to have. You know, you, you are who you are and, and those actions align with who you are. It's not who you're trying to be or what you're trying to do. If trying to make money, this is what, this is what we are. And this is what we do, you know? So it's a very similar story 
to the one you brought up right now. And you said that it's a tough market. And it's funny because so right now, the majority of my training is going for life insurance brokers, mm. mortgage brokers, mm -hmm. uh, car sales, which I know you, you dabble in a little bit of, mm -hmm. uh, but mostly phone sales, you know, mostly phone yeah. sales and referral kind businesses. And I'm actually telling people that, you know, because I've been through this market many times. I was in the mortgage industry for about 10 years. Yeah. Right? For one of the biggest, the, the biggest company in America. Wow. Uh, and I grew in that company and became a top salesperson like you and a top sales leader. And I became known as flipping the guys that were on their bottom, taking them to the top, the girls that were at the bottom, taking them to the top. And that's when I realized this talent that I had and I started exposing it to other sales. And that's when I realized that all sales was similar and the philosophies apply, whether you're selling vacuums or mortgages, it's all the same shit. Yeah. You know? Like you just yep. showed the picture of your goals and your vision where it's crazy. Like people think it's all the big complicated things. No, it starts with the small things, the gratitude, the goals. Matt yeah. Easton looking at those pictures in front of him all day is going to prime Matt Easton's mind to be successful because all he's looking at is his goals and his family all day. It's right around him. How's he going to yeah. get mad at a hang up on a phone call? It's not going to upset you. Your purpose is bigger than that. So right. I was, so I'm yeah, and, and people, to it's your... the hottest market. It's not the hard, it's not the hardest market. It's the no. hottest market because people need you the most right now. If your product or service has value and someone is willing to spend it on you, that means they really needed it. But what people need to understand is you got to pull that out of them, right? And you talked yeah. about it earlier. Your students could have the cure for cancer, Ace. And if you if they don't listen to what you're telling them and what you're coaching them it won't get sold and people will die. I mean, it's just that it's just that simple. And like, yeah. I, I, and I'm not even exaggerating. Like one of our students at Easton university, Monica, um, she came to us with no sales training, working in the medical industry. She sells programs to help screen people for cancer. She went and now she's the Number one, within six months, went from brand new hire to she's the number one person in the entire country for getting cancer screening. And I, whatever, fine, sales training, it worked. But here's what's really cool. There's, she, she can tell you story after story after story of, hey, I went and met with the teachers union in this particular city and talked to them and consulted them and used the things that we talk about and got them to screen. And we found seven teachers that had pancreatic cancer in stage one, which is treatable. You get to stage four of pancreatic cancer and it's a death sentence. And it's literally like, man, just here's somebody that had a good heart to begin with. And this is where I get frustrated with the people like that give me a hard time at jujitsu. Monica had a great heart, right? She was working for a great company. She had all the intentions in the world of wanting to help people. The company had the product to help people. Until she learned how to prospect, how to talk, how to communicate, how to handle objections, how to handle complaints, she would have had no chance of getting involved with that school district of all places, which, by the way, was like a maverick idea that she had. She's like, why don't we talk to school districts because they're unionized and we can get all the teachers screened at once and sold that brilliant idea. And now there's seven people. Hopefully all seven of them will live, but they've got a shot because somebody sold somebody on screening, right? Like, so the next time anybody, and I, I know I don't have to persuade you on this ace, but the next time somebody starts talking smack about a salesperson, realize everything in your world that is of any good, somebody sold it, somebody sold the idea to you. You had a friend in your life that hopefully you did, that sold you on not doing drugs. You had an older brother, an older sister that sold you on how to defend yourself against bullies. Your mom and dad sold you on, you know, getting up and getting a job. Like it's weird that the word sales and sale is such a bad word when really it's helping things move forward without the end. The, the other side of sales is death, right? It's, 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 it's not good. So um, that's something I get passionate about is, is this is all this really is, is, is a process for helping people help themselves. Right. Yeah. I wish we called sales, helping people help themselves because we'd have a lot people would look at us more like they do therapists and doctors. It is. It's funny because I record all of my coaching and all my classes and my editor in Arizona actually told me, Hey, I watched one of these coaching videos 
So there's sequences, you know, like I meet with somebody mm -hmm. for eight sessions or 18 sessions or whatever, however much they want, whether they're a leader of a big organization or they're an individual or they're a team. And what he told me was he watched one of the sequences with one of these teams in Michigan, right? About eight brokers on a team. And he said, I got addicted and I watched four in a row. And I said, why? He said, because you have something here. He said, it's not the coaching. The coaching is great. He said, the show is coaching mixed with therapy, mixed yeah. with entertainment. I love you know, it. and he said the interactions are awesome. And he's like, you should actually make coaching shows slash therapy sales, because a lot of it has to do with what's going on in their mind. we got to unfold that. And then we get into the sales, you know, so it always yeah. starts in the mind. A great leader named Matt Stouffer always told me there's no point of doing a game film with somebody, you know, listening to a call or practicing sales. If their mind's not in the right place, you're better off not doing it at all. You yeah. Know? Yeah, so you always got to make sure people's mind are in the right place. But as far as the sales stuff, Matt, here's what I told you. Maybe like a few years ago, you know, I thought about those things. I'm in a phase of my life right now where, listen, if it's not worth my breath, not worth my, I'm not even like, those people are not even on my mind. I don't even want to waste time on them on the right. podcast because those people that talk about sales, people like that, they talk about everything like that. Everything in life yeah. connects. They're not even worth me talking. I feel like we're at a point right now in life where, if you're going to leave one bad comment on a three minute video with the one thing I said wrong, right. You're right. Or all other two minutes and 55 seconds, then your mind's not in the right place because life's about soaking everything out like a sponge, right? Yep. Soaking out the value. I want Matt's value. I'm not here to judge Matt. I'm here to seek from Matt. What could I gain? Right. Yeah. And it's, it's like mortal combat, you know? I and love that stuff. Cause I mean, that's one of the easiest things I teach. Like if you want people to call you back, you can, cause I get those same comments, right? Like, look, well, this is just since we started, um, yeah. they're, they're coming through. Like, I hate your jackets. They're stupid. And then another person yeah. will be like, I like your jackets. They're nice. Yeah. Whatever. Right. You look ugly, you know, wh whatever. But the funny thing is all those people want to throw in their two cents and want to throw in their opinions. If you ever want somebody to call you back in business or even in your personal life, right? Leverage that leverage that our society is so opinion oriented and everybody's an expert on everything and just leave them this voicemail. Uh, hey, Ace, Matt Easton, founder of Easton University. I got an idea I'd love to get your opinion on. Can you call me on my mobile 720-660-3202? Now all of a sudden they call you back, right? Like the, you can look at the world and go, okay, here's what's going on. How can I just change the way I interact with it? And it's like these same people that are talking all this smack. If I left them that voicemail, they call me back in two seconds, right? It's, yeah, it's <laughs> and this is actually great. This is what I wanted to get into. I wanted to get into the sales philosophies that we both have. Mm -hmm. I think some of them are different. Some of them are alike. You know, we're a perfect example. Like we could look at each other as competition. I'm sure Easton University is a sales university, right? Correct. And I have ACES Academy, which is sales leadership mindset, team development, same exact thing, concept, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So we're not looking at competition. We're, we're building this together, right? We're growing together because it's important to keep good people in your network, which is why, you know, we're here together today. Yeah. Uh, but so the voicemail, like, see, like I have a different perspective on that. I think, I think that's a great idea. And I think I would use that if my play doesn't work, I would fall back on that if I'm not getting the mm -hmm. call back. Sure. I usually teach in the voicemails. Get straight to the point, provide the value. Go throw an icebreaker out there, something that was relevant off the last call or the last interaction you had, but mm -hmm. give the value. You know, hey, Matt, I hope you had a great time at your son's soccer game. Hopefully you scored some goals. I sent you the email over. We're saving you $600 a month. I know that money's crucial. The market is moving up very quickly. Give me a call back as soon as you get this. I'm only here till three o'clock. Like, so I believe like if you're providing value, Give that value out to them. Tell them why that value is important. Leave them with a nugget for why they're going to call you back because I believe in the service and the product and how it's helping somebody. So I usually lead with the emotion and the value up front. I'm very upfront in business and in sales, which people tend to appreciate. But yeah. if that doesn't work, I'd love to like, I, like, I think that's a good backup play for me to have where I could call them and say, I haven't heard back from you in three days. I got a great idea here. I want to run it past you before I make any moves. Give me a call back. So I actually respect that play. What do you think of the way that I approach it? I love it. Here's, here's kind of my, here's what popped into my brain when you were saying what you're saying, right? Um, for the folks that don't understand what martial arts is or the UFC is or whatever, there probably is nobody out there that doesn't understand it. Here's the thing with sales training. It's like martial arts. And my opinion with martial arts is they're all good. Jiu-jitsu is just the one that I like. But if somebody comes up to me and is like, man, I'm a black belt in karate or I'm, my jam is taekwondo or I'm, I wrestled, I'm a division one wrestler. 
hate those guys, by the way. Hmm. Oh God, they're the worst. You get a 20 year old kid that was a division one wrestler. Oh, they'll eat your lunch, right? Those are the yeah. best athletes on planet earth. But I don't care if you're into wrestling, karate, jujitsu, taekwondo. It's all good. It all teaches you self-discipline. It all teaches you a process. It will all make you better. So I, 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 I love your stuff. And I think the problem out there in the world is there's people that are not going, should I go with Easton University or should I go with Ace Academy? There's people out there going, I don't need sales training or worse. That's not the worst group. The worst group are the ones that are like, I'm freaking good, man. I went to President's Club last year and my wife and I went to Bora Bora. Again, not to put too many NFL references, but can you imagine, brother, if we were in the NFL and we said we're good? Like, let's say we, you, you were quarterback. I was receiver. You were at Florida state. I was at LSU and we're, you're number one in the draft. I'm number two. And we both get drafted to the Patriots and Bill Belichick goes, Hey, Hey, show up on Sunday. Right. And you're like, no, nah, bro, I'm good. Right. They'd be like, all right, Hey, get your stuff. Um, your locker. Yeah. Clean it out. Like it's weird how professional athletes get this, but business people don't in that you're not good. You have to practice this stuff every day and there's new things that you can learn every day and the industry is changing every day. And just because you're successful right now and your wife and you are going to Bora Bora and you made President's Club for the last seven years, that tells me that you're not where you could be. Like perhaps you could be CEO of the company or hey, you could get all your work done in a half hour. Like you can always get better. You always need to be drilling, practicing and rehearsing. Whatever that system is, whether it's Ace's system, my system, whoever's system, there is some old stuff left over from like back in the day when people didn't have these things that I'd maybe avoid. But for the most part, even if you go through the really, really old stuff, it's still good. It's still all good. I mean, start with books. You know, my brother always told me, yeah. uh, tell me how much, uh, how many books you've read. I'll tell you who you are. I'm like, books change my life. I mean, learn from the most masterful pieces out there. And like, they always say like the difference between a master and a student is the master remains a student. A hundred percent. They never say they're a master, right? They hundred percent, hundred percent. And even in today, dying, so. yeah. And what bothers me and you probably had a similar situation with your background. What bothers me is there's all these resources today that I never had. And ain't just about anybody can afford one of these. Like, even if you're not going to read a book, which by the way, you could bootleg a PDF of a book. If you didn't by even have way, money, audible's uh, not that much. It's, it's 333. So just letting you know, three what's three, that? It's 333 on your phone. Okay. I believe whenever you see numbers like that. It ah, be... there it is. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you go follow Ace on social media. You don't want to read a book, follow Ace. Like, I'm not asking you to change your life, but. Dude, can you follow one less like dogs in bikinis page or, you know, um, stunts gone wrong account and follow just for every 50 booty shaker accounts that you follow right mm -hmm. now or whatever your jam is cooking channels, go follow ACE. Okay. And then watch that stuff. Go follow me and watch that stuff and tell me if your life doesn't get a little bit better because I'm sure there's some way your life can get better watching, you know, dance moves on to, and again, I'm not poo pooing any of that. I'm fine. If that's your jam and you like watching snakes, rattlesnakes, eat penguins, go for it, but mix in a little stuff. That's going to maybe challenge you a little bit and help you get better along the way. It's free. I'm going to repeat that again. It is free. Last time I checked, it is free to follow ACE. Why aren't you doing it? right? Yeah, yeah. Go find some people that are going to spread in not just negativity, but Hey, here's a new idea. Have you thought about this? Right. The next time your kids trying to do your homework, instead of saying, Hey, do you got to do your homework? No, I'm tired. Do you want to do your homework? Absolutely not. I'm tired. Right. Hey, little buddy, does it make sense to do your homework before hockey practice? No, I'm tired. Got it. What's a good next step then? What do you mean? What's a good next step? You don't want to do your homework before hockey practice. Where do we go from here? Oh, well, you're going to take away my iPad. I guess I'll just do my homework before hockey practice, right? Like that you can learn this stuff. And even if you don't work in sales, you can find it makes life a lot easier. Hey boss, I noticed there's that new regional manager sales position open. Does it make sense to put me in that role? No, 
Got it. What's a good next step then? Uh, I'm not sure. Makes sense. What's a good next step for me? Uh, what we're interviewing for it next week, is there any way you could put a document together that would explain to us why you would be a good fit for that role? Absolutely. When should I have it to you? Right? Instead of, hey, boss, there's a new regional manager position available. Can I have that job? No. Why not? I don't know. I hate my job. I need to find a new job. No, you need to figure out a way to be more skillful and help communicate with people so that you can get what you want out of the life. Some people call that sales. I call that just being able to navigate this crazy thing that we call being alive. Yeah, they say curiosity killed the cat, but consistency and persistence saved it. Mm -hmm. So if somebody tells me what's the next step, they show up for the next step, they keep Bingo. showing up. I'm like, damn, this person's really about it. You know, I can't even ah. get the, I can't even get the person in the role to answer an email on time. And this person been showing up in my office every day. So you could prove yourself in that fashion as well. I had uh, a guy we were going to hire and this is a pretty high dollar role. And I talked to him on Friday and he had sent over his, what he wanted for the salary. Okay, what he wanted for the salary, not what I wanted to pay, which I thought was cool. And I looked at it and fell out of my chair at first. And then I was like, well, you know, man, this guy seems like he could get the job done. We had scheduled. He said, I will call you on Monday and we'll, we'll go over this and see where we're at. Friday night, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. My wife, again, she's smarter than she is beautiful. And she's really beautiful. She says to me, this is way too much. You don't need to pay this guy this. To, of course, to which I was like, ah, oh, no, I think I need to pay him. So Saturday morning, I send this guy an email and I'm like, Alan, call me. I'm looking over your stuff. I've got a few questions. Call me. I expected a call on Saturday. Nothing. Monday comes when he was supposed to call me. Nothing. Crickets. And I call this other guy who referred me to Alan. And I'm like, oh, no, the other guy called me. He's like, hey, what's going on with Alan? I got two other references from people. I know somebody's going to snatch him up if you don't snatch him up. And I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, what, what do you mean? I'm like, he didn't, he didn't even call me back. He's like, hold on, let me call him. Still two hours goes by. And he had a babysitter come in and be like, yo, you need to call this guy. And then finally, Alan calls me or emails me eight o'clock on, on Monday night. And he's like, oh, sorry. Uh, he didn't even say sorry. He's just, you know, I had a family member that had COVID. And so I was attending to a family member with COVID. And that's why I failed to follow up with you. And I'm CCing Eric, who's my friend on this because Eric called me, right? It was like the most unskillful moment ever. And once again, I defer to my wife and her gut, like we should have never hired that guy. Like in life, and by the way, anybody out there that's whining about money, this was a very high dollar position. All, and thank you, Alan, wherever you're at in the world, because all Alan had to do was call me on Saturday, right? And answer my one question. I had one single question and I was going to give him every penny. And then I was going to give him some bonus money. And my wife was real pissed about that. She's like, you're too generous. Stop it with the bonuses. You're paying him for a job. Have him do the job. I was going to even throw in some bonuses. Didn't call me back. Sunday didn't call me back all day. Money when he was supposed to call me back, didn't call me back. Like in this, this wasn't a sales role. This was a, a marketing type role. Had Alan at least looked at life as a sale and went, okay, and by the way, I don't, I'm sorry, not to sound ruthless. I don't care if your family member has COVID. You're not literally, if you're literally pounding on their chest to keep them alive and doing mouth to mouth, okay? Saturday, Sunday, Monday, great. You lost a job over it, but you saved a family member. There was nothing, you, he's not a freaking brain surgeon. Like, and this just bothers me that there's people that are like, I have to have a work-life balance and I have to have boundaries. That is the, having that philosophy is the worst way to be happy at either. I don't have work-life balance. I just have a great freaking life. Are there things that I have to do at work that I don't enjoy doing? Absolutely. Are there things that in my personal life that I don't enjoy doing? Absolutely. I'm not a huge fan of working out. I do it every day, right? But you have to realize, okay, in life, things are not just going to be handed to me. And if they were, I wouldn't enjoy them. You know what? Why don't I figure out a process? Why don't I make this? Like Alan should have been like, as soon as he got that email, even if the fam, we've all had COVID, even if family member had COVID, hold on. Let's say the family member was terminally ill or just hit by a car hold on one second. I've got a job. Let me just step out. Hey, Matt, it's Alan. You know, we've got something going on with a family member here, but I wanted to respond to your email. What's up? 
right? I would have said, Alan, take care of your family. Call me on Monday. I just want to let you know for what it's worth. I think we've got a fit here, brother. You go attend to your family. But he ignored me for three days and it cost him big, big money. And the oh. sad thing is you see this ace every day. The same people that are coming to you going, my job sucks. My company sucks. My boss sucks. I guarantee you, if you went into their job, Ace, if you said, fine, time out, I'll do your job for you, you would have them. They would be number one because you've done it a hundred times before. Because it's just simply, you would go in there with a great attitude and a process and you'd do the work. It's not even that much work that needs to be done, right? We're not attempting space travel. I mean, that guy sounds like a, like a cancer, to be honest. I mean, the second he's... 100%, which is why yeah. every time, and I have to keep reminding myself, when Heather has a gut feeling, you just and Heather was like, dude. My wife's and the I same was like, way. It's funny you say that, because her gut feelings, well, usually she rubs it in my face because I don't agree with them up front. So. <laughs> Me too. And then I always yeah. realized she was right the whole time. But yeah. yeah, it's like that. That was the best thing that I, and I told her that I'm like, this is the best thing that could have ever happened to the company that we were going to hire him for, because I'm like, he would have come in here and it would have taken us two, three months. Oh man, the, the Raiders, the it's takers. Not the Raiders. It's takers. It was uh, the name of uh, the group of people I used to train for five years. It was about I love it. People. And if you weren't a taker, you couldn't join the academy. And takers a way of life. We did kind of gank the Raiders signal, but we kind of switched Sweet. the face with the skeleton under. What's and the, the FOE? That was to match your client. If you're talking to an old lady in Georgia, be the old guy in Georgia. If you're talking to somebody that wants numbers quick, be quick. You know, match the tempo of your client and Got be it. whatever you need to be in life to get what you need to get. Um, love it. But takers I love it. also a meaning of someone that takes advantage of the opportunity in their life every single day. And honestly, Matt, if somebody comes to me with, with that perspective, like I, I tell people like leaders sometimes tell me, should I fire this guy? Should I keep this guy? And I run a couple experiments with them and I tell them exactly what to do. And if they don't pass those experiments, like, and you give them a couple of shots, like you don't want that in your business. I don't care if you're a top producer, but you're a cancer and negative. You could go take that top production somewhere else. It's all about culture as much as it is about sales because culture is going to take you farther. Right? Yeah. But here's yeah, what I do before I'm willing to train any company on sales or leadership development. The first thing I do is I train them on mindset. My first training with people is called the four zones. And I go okay. over your personal zone, your work zone, your family zone slash friends. If you have friends, I mean, my close friends are family anyway. So I just call it family mm -hmm. zone. In right. your passion zone. And I talk about how to allocate time in those zones. More importantly, specific times with no distractions, right? Mm -hmm. If you're with your wife and you're playing with your phone, it probably doesn't mean like it was a good experience and you got a lot of content out of that date. But if you and your wife put your phones in the middle, you guys communicate throughout that whole day, have some laughs, you know, that's what real family time is. And same thing with work. If you're at work and playing with your phone, looking at TikToks, it's not the same. When I'm at work, I'm in my war zone, doors closed. Lights or spotlights yeah. around like I'm on stage. I'm in, I'm at war, you know, nobody can get yeah. in my way. And I talk about those four zones and that's how I get rid of the work-life balance. I just talk about having balance throughout these four zones in your life because allocating proper time to them will make you a happy, successful individual. Right yeah. after that, they have to send pictures and proof that they spent time in all four of those zones for 10 days before starting the training. Then after 10 days, I say, all right, it seems like your minds are right. You guys got your morning rituals done. You spent time with your family. You got back to your passions. You focused at work. Now I'm ready to talk to you. And they have to go through that before I start my training cycle, because I don't want anybody that's minds in the gutter at my training. Yeah, because they'll blow it up for everybody else. And if they can't do that simple test and wake up a little early and spend time on themselves, then guess what? If you couldn't do that for five, seven days, you know, how bad do you really want it? Maybe this isn't for you. Right. And the funny thing is, I think most people that have some semblance of success, they're like, I want it, I want it. And then they get it a couple of times. And then what we end up finding out is it's not even the, whatever it is you're working towards on your daily goal sheet or whatever. It's not necessarily hitting that thing, buying that car, getting that watch, whatever it is. It's you then start to appreciate the process, right? And like one of my biggest things when I, worked in the corporate world just because I'm paranoid by nature. Like I used to wake up in sweats in the middle, by the way, it was number one person at every company I worked for. And still like clockwork every night, about three o'clock in the morning, I'd wake up with a panic attack nightmare that I got fired. 
right? Maybe it's because I just grew up not having any money and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to get fired. What? It wasn't until I really developed some habits and some processes that I personally could sleep well at night. And it had nothing to do with, did we get wins? How much money was I making? I was like, listen, I have a process. I'm going to trust my process. I'm going to give it up to the process. If I find better ways to improve the process, that's great. But until I get some new information to fix my process, guess what? I'm going to wake up every morning. I'm going to do the right stuff that I need to do and good things are going to happen. And it doesn't take too long before you have a process like that, before it's like, sometimes I feel like maybe reincarnation is real because I'm like, I look at people, I'm like, God, there's levels to this whole life thing. And like, it's so much easier. Like it really is not that hard. If you just follow, like you were saying some very specific, simple, not hard processes things will click. And yeah, are you going to win all the time? Absolutely not. Are you going to lose some of the time? Sure. But you'll be like, man, on those times, you'll be like, oh, thank God. They canceled. <laughs> they canceled that meeting because I, I could use a sandwich. You know, I've been running around and doing things like you get to a point where even the bad stuff that happens doesn't even sting that much because you're like, I know if I do this, I know if I that's just a level, these- by the way, once you could get to that, that's a, that's a level. Once you could get to like, what like my wife always tells me, you know, like, uh, why do you just wave past everything? Like, no, this I'm like, I know that happened. I really don't want to focus on that negative thing. Mm-hmm. I tell you what the solution is, and I focus on something else because it's not worth my energy. And you just said it yourself. You know, are you gonna even the bad things? You're like, oh, I could get a sandwich. I really <laughs> right. Need it, you know. Instead right. Of being like, oh, somebody canceled the meeting. What the hell? And like my business. I'm like, you know, going into that spiral. You know. I always say like, uh, you know, I'm like a crack fiend looking for the next positive thing. Give me a positive. Give me a positive, like a Pac-Man game. Anything negative, throw it out, throw it out, throw it out, throw it out. And sometimes it hurts my, uh, it hurts my listening, my active listening, because when somebody's negative, I tend to block them out. But sometimes I got to remind myself, this person might really need me. Let me listen to them and try to help, you know? Yeah. Uh, So yeah, I do use that as well. When talking to people on training people, but I think, I think you're on the right track, man. And I think you're doing great things and you're inspiring, which is important, but that's definitely a level. I'll tell everybody listening out there that, listen, if you want somebody to open a business with you, if you want to hire somebody that you think is good, the first ultimate test is, are they a successful, happy individual, not in their job, but in their life? Because if I'm fighting with my family, I'm behind on my bills. I got a drug problem. I'm not going to come here. And you're you're a hundred and you're 150 yeah. pounds overweight. No disrespect to those people. But if you can't even manage. Yeah. If you can't even get through your drive through work without having an emotional breakdown, because such and such happened on the news, you're probably not going to be able to skillfully manage. Correct. It's connected. That's so that's why I tell people like you got to fix your personal life first, find happiness within find your passions, spend time. Like I love spending time alone. I'm not sure about you. Do you meditate or anything like that? I do. Yeah. 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 Like meditation, like think about how fast the world moves and think about people. And we probably used to be one of these people that never, ever sit down by ourselves and just think to ourselves, how are things going? Where am I at right now in my life? I was the kid that couldn't, there was no cell phones and I couldn't get a date with a girl to save my life. So I spent a lot of time by myself um, it, miserable. And then I, and now I wish I could go back because I'm like, I'm so busy now, man. I wish I could go back. I would have picked up a book. I would have mapped things out. I mean, I could have been way ahead where I'm at right now. Had I just had it in my darkest times, if I just kept that positive attitude and followed a plan, even if it's a bad plan, right? Like, even if it's not the best plan, just followed a plan. Where do I need to go? Who like answer? If I just, just, it, by the way, anybody who's in a bad spot right now, just take 10 minutes quietly by yourself and write down, where do I need to go? Who do I need to talk to? And what do I need to do? Spend five minutes on each of those three questions. There's no wrong answers there, right? Like you're going to find things. But if you spend all of your time talking to talking to Ace, pulling Ace aside and be like, I mean, can, can you imagine what's going on and who's going to be president next? And that's terrible. And did you see what so-and-so said? And then, <laughs> hey, hey, Ace, what would you, here's another question nobody asks. Hey, Ace, what would you do if you were in my position, right? You don't yeah. have to take their advice. 
right? Like, hey, and by the way, when you see somebody that's where you want to go, how did you get there, right? Is there any advice you'd give me as a 16-year-old? People like Ace, I guarantee you, Ace, you are dying. You are just dying inside for some kid to run up behind you in the grocery store and tap you on the shoulder and go, yo, I saw you pull up. I'm 16 years old. What would you do if you were me, right? You would be like, I'll take him in brother. like, uh, I'll take him in like Sonny took in Caladro and Bronxdale. Totally. But the problem is now I'm sure you get 16 year olds asking you that right now, but they're asking you that in your DMs. Cause this is what I get in your social media. And they're like, Hey, by the way, I know the greatest thing in the world. And if you sign up with me, you'll get 10 million followers. And they, they, that God forbid, they say they don't know what they're doing, right? God forbid they come up to you and say, listen, like I, that was one of the things that made me successful initially when I was 14 years old, I bagged groceries and maybe that's why I liked watches. I would look for watches. Right. And I was like, I would seriously be like new, I always set new policies. I'd be like new policy at King supers, new policy. Mm-hmm. I walk you out to your car, right? Never got in trouble for it. Cause they'd be like, no, I'm good with my groceries. I'm like, sorry, sir. It's a new store policy. Can you believe it? Right. And as I'm pushing out the guy, I'd be like, So what do you do? And now granted, there was some stuff I was not interested in. I was not interested in being a dentist, right? So like if somebody said dentist, I was like, cool, man, that's great. Like log check, another check mark for dentist driving a BMW. But when somebody was like, yeah, you know, so I work at this company, it's called Celestial Seasonings. I I know Celestial Seasonings, Red Zinger T. Yeah, yeah, I work for Mo Siegel and we're over there on the hill. I, I do marketing. Perfect, yeah, hey, my name's Matt Easton. I'm 14 years old. You guys need any trash picked up. You need dog pooped up, picked up in your lawn. You need weeds, Christmas lights put up. The guy was like, how much do you charge? Nothing, right? I work here at King Supers. You can find me here till 3.30 every single day this summer. I will be here. You come, here's what I want, right? I just want to hang around you. Just want to hang around you. You'd be amazed how many people are like, yeah, yeah, come on over. I maybe pick up three dog poops. Next thing you know, the guy was like, hey, so here's what you need to do. Okay. So here's an idea you maybe haven't thought of. You should charge for this. And here's all of a sudden, all this wealth of information, just by, instead of number one, hating you're seeking it when you're 14 years old, because when I was 14, I wasn't even seeking these things. I think this more happened, you know, 20, 21, 22 is when I started getting into self-development. I was desperate. Uh, I didn't know it was self-development. I hadn't read any books, but I just knew I didn't, I didn't want to be where I was at. Right. I couldn't, couldn't fight. Yeah, no, you had the funny. you had the fire from when you were young and you wanted to get out of that cage and you did it man. for sure. That's good. 100%. 100%. Yeah. And I was walking wherever he's at today. Merle Sacknoff walked his dog. Uh Bill Kitchen who ended up being one of my mentors. Um you know, hey, what can you do? Hey man, I invite I invent amusement park rides. Perfect. How can I be a part of that? Right? Like that's how I started Pendulum Sportswear and Design, which was the leading apparel company for Six Flags for um uh Disney Tucson Freud to Sinfreud, which is Viking land. That's their rip off of Disneyland in Norway. No disrespect to my, I don't even know if Tucson Freud's still open, but I was faxing them from the King Supers where I used to work, purchase orders for like $6,000 worth of t-shirts, $9,000 worth of polos because I was hanging out with this Bill Kitchen guy. And he was like, dude, we're selling these rides. And I'm like, man, that's cool. What else, man, I don't have time for this, but you know what somebody ought to do. As soon as I heard that, right? Uh, you know what somebody ought to do? Somebody ought to put a catalog together for these amusement parks with their logo on it. Cause these guys need apparel. They need hats. They need t-shirts. Huh? Hey, hey, Bill, could, would you be cool with giving me your customer list? Yeah, yeah, sure. All right. Bang. Go to, I went to gold. What was it called? Golden thread or golden needle or something in Boulder, Colorado. I'm like, give me your guys's catalog. They're like, okay, cool. King, what pricing can you give me? They're like, depends on how much you order. I'm like, cool, we'll figure all that out later. Went to Kinko's, made a new cover for the catalog, Pendulum Sportswear and Design, ripped off the Golden Needles cat- cover, stapled my cover on, mailed it to all these amusement parks. Next thing I know, orders in this pre-internet, orders start coming in through the mail, right? Like I would have never figured that out had I not pushed that dude's groceries out one day and not over a lunch, Hey, what would you do if you were me, right? Like guys, there is money just flying. If you're not into money, there's opportunities for you to change the world. They're right there. All you got to do is reach up and grab one. It's there. 100%. Next time you you see Ace in the grocery store, tap him on the shoulder. 
I enjoy actually training the people that are on their last leg for say and struggling. I enjoy taking those people and making them superheroes because those are the stories you really remember. Yeah. And honestly, when those people are ready for the training and they're ready to change, I mean, that's what I was known for for a long time. If anyone was struggling, go to Ace, go to Ace. He, he changed my life, go to Ace. So if anyone's, you know, listening, those are the kind of people that, you know, make the best stories. It's nice to take somebody average and make them great, but it's even better to take somebody in a darker spot in their life and turn them into a superhero. Those are the stories that you remember. For sure. But it's not always, it's not always that easy, is it? I mean, that's, that's something that I have to work on every day. They have like, to want it. If they, I know. If they want it, it's easy. Yes. It's and that's where my, that's where my trainer, Heather Easton is helping me is setting up. Cause I think maybe I need to have a little bit thicker skin is she's like, you got to cut bait. Cause if they don't want it, you'll sit there ace. And then you end up just doing things for them. And, or worse, you're like telling them the same thing. I get it. Maybe I, maybe I, maybe I'm less than skillful in articulating sometimes. So I'll tell you something twice, but if it's now the fifth time where I've given you the exact same advice, clearly all you want to do is complain and you don't want to take action right? Like if I've given you advice three times and you're not coming back to me and going, I tried it and it didn't work and can articulate back to me. Okay. Well, when you say you tried it, tell me exactly what you said, right? I, I don't remember, but I did exactly what you told. How is it that you don't remember it now, but you did it then, right? Or man, I said it exactly. And boom, they know it. But then I tried this nuance. Like if you're, you know, real quickly, Ace, if somebody's taking action or not, and that's something I'm trying to work on right now is not investing my time with those people because there's very many of them that well, they're, well by the way well, they're, they're great they'll buy your program and everything but it's, it's not yeah, worth the money half the time having they're investing them in the program. They're, they're investing their money and their time to be with you if i pay for a personal trainer why would i go to the gym and not train with my personal trainer if i already had to pay in advance i don't really spend time on that i mean i am a little more aggressive and i'm okay being aggressive because you know I'm from working in corporate downtown Detroit. So, I mean, mm. I was, I was raised in an aggressive culture and my students appreciate the aggression. And sometimes, you know, they don't want to be part of that aggression. It's uncomfortable. So they don't want that, but yeah, I don't really take a lot of shit in my, <laughs> my trainings, you know, Good. I'm pretty straightforward and straight to the point. And uh, I make sure it's ingrained in your mind. When I give it to you, I give it to you nine different ways on a platter and I make you eat it. And then I make sure you understand it and I move on. I don't go back. So yeah. you can't even I ask a question to go back to a category uh, once you're past it. Um, I wanted to get into a lot more sales stuff with you, but I'm sure we're going to meet again in the future. Absolutely. We'll connected. Anytime. But why don't we do this? Why don't we, why don't you give me your top three sales nuggets? I'll give you my top three. If you had to break down the top three sales skills to make somebody a top sales professional, why don't we shoot them out one by one? You do the first one. I'll do the first one. Then second, second, third, third, you could go first. My first one is very easy. Okay. And it go find a book. If you don't like my training, if you don't like ACEs training, buy a book. My first sales nugget is this. If you think I am a born talker, I was the most popular kid at my school, right? I'm, I'm, I have the gift of the gab. Okay. That has nothing to do with your success in sales. If you think you're an introvert, and you a shade, you don't like talking to people, you're uncomfortable, that still has nothing to do with your success in sales. My first nugget is no matter where you think you are in the spectrum, get a freaking process. Pick a process. Go look up Ace Academy. Come over to Easton University. Buy a freaking book. Even if it's one of those from 1912, uh, get a process. You thinking that you're naturally good at something, you may have an innate gravity towards something, but you still need a process. You still need a game plan. If the lions show up on Sunday with no game plan, the quarterback's getting sacked. Well, it's the lions. They might get sacked regardless, but you got to have a, sorry. Uh, you got to have a game. You got to have a game plan. So that's my first tip is just find a process and stick to it. Yeah. My first tip would be uh, to get your mindset right spend quality time, figure out the issues in your life, how they can be resolved, get the negativity out and mindset and preparation. Also find yourself to be extra prepared. So if reading is part of being prepared, read, if you got to make a script, if you got to practice objections, if you got to work out and wake up early, whatever that is to get yourself prepared and get your mindset, right. I think that's the first and most important thing before we get into the sales stuff. What's your second? 
my second, and this one's a bit controversial because this goes against most of the other training out there. Um, it, this is the same for life. And it's, by the way, if you're, if you have a sales process and you're like, I would never use that on a date, it might not be the right sales process for you. Right. And so my second tip is this, because this is, this will help you out in life too. 90% of the things that you're labeling as an objection and trying to overcome, right. I'm trying to come up with a clever response. I'm trying to get you to change your mind are not objections at all. They're complaints. Okay. In life, just because somebody has a complaint doesn't mean they're not going to do something. My wife complained about going out with me forever. Okay. You got to realize this. Stop wherever you're at, trying to get a promotion at work, trying to make a sale, trying to get a date. Stop trying to win every single what you think is objection or argument and turning it into an argument and just have a process. And that process should include going with the flow and agree with them. man, your price is too high. I get it. I'm with you right? If you're showing them a house, I don't like stairs. Come on. I get, I totally get it. Let's walk on up the stairs. At one, every objection has one thing in common. If it's truly stopping them from doing the thing that you want them to do, giving you a promotion, buying that house, going out on a date with you, buying your software, they will bring it up again. But too many salespeople are out there trying to create a perfect sale, meaning anything Ace says, I'm going to get a witty comeback. That's not sales. That's fighting. And you're, you're, you're winning deals. Yeah. But you're beating the person up in the process. Chill out just because you think something's an objection. There's a 90% chance. It's just a complaint. They're still going to do what you want them to do. So you're saying be agreeable before tackling 100%. or arguing. hundred percent. Right? We have eight steps. Our process, we have eight steps for handling an objection. Step one. Well, steps one and two, number one in your head, just say to yourself, they're still going to do this. It's not that they're not going to do this. And step two is exactly what you said. Agree. Be agreeable. I hear you. I'm with you. Makes yeah. perfect sense. I get our step it. One, our step one is acknowledged. So it's very similar to that. Yeah. And yeah. guess what? Your freaking stuff works, doesn't it? Right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's the people that are like, oh, you know, when I hear that, it typically means one of two things. Either you don't have the authority to buy. Like, can you imagine trying that crap on a date? Right. You know, when I hear that a lady doesn't want to go out with me, it typically means one of two things. Either she's so intimidated by slap. Right. Like you got to just be agreeable. Just flow. Yeah. Just chill. And my, and, my, and my second thing, OK, to hit you back would be likability. I think the real reason people hang out with you, you could go on dates, you could last in a marriage, you could have a good time with your kids. You could work, you could grow, and you could sell as likability before the product, before the service, before the price, before any of that, just simply about making somebody like you. So one yeah. of my biggest pieces of, pieces of advice for people and what really works is, hey, pretend we're at a bar having drinks with your best friend. The mm -hmm. same way you talk to them is the same way I want you to talk to me. The same way you talk to them is the same way I want you to talk to people that you're trying to sell or you're trying to help or whoever it is that you're, your boss to interview like, don't yeah. be so tense, be yourself, right? And you find that every single human being has their own specific unique character traits. Yeah. Those unique character traits is what attract people to like you. So the reason why somebody might like you is different than the reason somebody might like me, but you have something special that I don't have. Are you showing that specialness? Yeah, I love it. Are you it. attracting and people with it? And are you marketing it, right? Because yeah. that's what makes you unique. And that would be my second thing is likability. What is your third and last thing? Uh, have a close, okay? Have a system for closing. It's funny how many times I'll talk to big clients. They'll be like, we don't need sales training. We had Neil Rockham in here three years ago, spent 85 grand. I'm like, cool. What did, what did Neil tell you to close deals, right? Like learn a close. Like our close is so simple. It's, does it make sense to blank? right? If I ask you, does it make sense to blank? Whatever the blank is, clean your room, promote me to regional manager, buy the software, sign up for our membership. I'm not asking you to do anything. Okay. So I'm not putting any pressure on you, but the importance is by saying, does it make sense? I'm asking you a timing question. And by the way, I wish I knew this. I would have gone to a lot more proms because I would have went up to girls. Hey, so just out of curiosity, does it make sense for you and I to go to prom together? Uh, no, you don't have a car. Got it what's a good next step then, right? Mm -hmm. When you say, does it make sense? It perfectly positions you to say, what's it not? No, well, not what's the best next step. 
What's a good next step? And by the way, if they say, I don't know, just point that question back at yourself then and say, got it, fair enough. What's a good next step on my end? Or what's a good next step for me, right? So in that prom case, it would have sounded something like this. Uh, hey, Zora, oh, Zora was the girl I always wanted to go to prom with. Uh, hey, this is what I did. Hey, Zora, perhaps if you're not going to prom with anybody else, uh, I, I'm going to prom. No, beat it, nerd, get out of here, right? That's how it went down. But what if I just said this? Hey, Zora, you know, just out of curiosity, does it make sense for you and I to go to prom together? A uh, no. Got it. What's a good next step then? Well, I'm going to prom with Ike Palmer. Got it. What's a good next step for me? Well, I don't know because I'm going to prom with Ike. Got it. So has Ike asked you yet? No. Okay. How about we do this? It's Monday today. Prom's coming up next Saturday. How about if I'll circle back with you Friday? I know Ike's got a couple other girls in mind and he can only take one of them. That way, if you're not going with Ike, we can talk about going, right? Like just simply set a next step. Don't be pushy. Don't be manipulative. Does it make sense to blank? If they say no, what's a good next step then? If they say, I don't know, what's a good next step for me? If they still say, I don't know, which they won't set a next step. I'll call you Tuesday, but I haven't heard from me before then. Fair enough. Simple close, but everybody should have a close. 100%. I don't know if I would uh, uh, do it with a prom if, uh, if a girl tells me no, but uh, uh, I would use it in sales if I need to. I, I usually sure. go with like providing the value, right? Mm -hmm. And fighting for that value, using the emotions to justify my logic and telling them why they need it. Tell them, hey, I'm not going to give up on this. I'm going to give you a call tomorrow morning. I'm going to send you an email. Please review it with your wife. If it mm -hmm. doesn't make sense, let me know. If she has any questions, let me know. But here's the reason why I'm on the phone with you and why I'm still trying to get this done for you. Boom, boom, boom. Hit you with the same emotions you gave me. You got a process. And see, so you were able to articulate that. Most of the folks out there, hey, what do you, oh man, I'm a master of, it's like, dude, that's like, that's like these people that come into Eastern Training Center. And I'm like, they're, they're like, hey, you know, I'm a master at fighting and da, da. Okay, cool. So what do you, you know, how do you do an arm? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And they have, I don't know answers to everything else. Right. It's like, if somebody says they're a master at sales and they make millions of dollars a year and they can't answer, how do you close deals? Something is amiss there. And unfortunately, most people go their whole lives without working in sales, knowing without knowing what the close is. That's like being in football and not knowing what a forward pass is. I get it. You've won a few games by running the football, but might be nice to know how to pass, right? It's like important yeah. stuff. But unfortunately, back to what we were saying earlier, people go and they have some semblance of success. And then they think, I don't need to learn anything new. I'm good. That's a fixed mindset. The fixed mindset is no bueno, dude. No bueno. And I have billionaire friends with a B, billions, and they have a growth mindset. They are all, now the difference is, when I ask them questions, there's two types of people, by the way, those that are trying to make their first billion and those that are trying to keep it. I do have friends that are trying to keep it. So their answers are a little bit different than mine because I'm, I'm trying to get there, right? Got to get there. But everybody on either side of the spectrum that's any sort of successful in life and is happy has a growth mindset, right? 100%. Ace, why are you doing that? Tell me, explain. Then that, that sounds cool, right? They're not locked into this is the only way that this can happen. Because there's a million ways you can do stuff and you'll always be able to find a better way. Yeah. No, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Like I told you earlier, you know, it's about growing or dying, right? The master's always- you're, Yeah. And, and by yeah. the way, even if you're not dying, which I agree with you 100% Ace, that you are dying if you're not growing, who wants to live like that? It's boring. That's boring. You need to be getting better at something. If it floats your boat and you're truly happy and you're not complaining, then, you know, by all means, be yourself, right? Yeah. But if you're complaining and you're being negative, then you have no right to if you're not living the lifestyle of growing every single day. So it just depends on what people want out of their life. I have friends that are comfortable with their salary and they're comfortable with their life and they're comfortable with fantasy football and they're comfortable with Netflix and they're comfortable doing what they're doing. And I don't judge them for that because yeah, they're but happy. I'm going to push back on that a little bit okay. because here's the thing. They're still growing because it, even though it might be fantasy football, I guarantee you that's their passion. And they're like, how do I beat, how do I beat the ace off face off team? Right. They found there's still anybody who's happy has something in their life where it's challenging to them. It's not easy. 
it's got to work, right? They're working at it. Um, it just not, might, might not be the traditional things that we label, right? Maybe they hike, maybe they're trying to get better with their kids, right? But there's something. If you're like, I am good at everything, I don't need to improve. Those people are not happy. They're just not. Right. And even the people that you think are good at everything, like if you like, I know it's going to sound weird, but Justin Bieber is one of those people. Like if the lights went off, that dude could the dude can do anything. Like he'd fix it. That guy's like, man. Yeah. So how do you do that? How do you do that? Hockey? How do you do that? The, 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 like always trying to figure out something else to do, something else to get better at. Right. Even these people that you think from the outside are like, oh my gosh, they're super happy. And I wish I had their life they're still waking up every day going, what's the next challenge? What can I do? What can I do to get better? How can I be more skillful with my kids, right? How can I, how can I figure out how to help my church or whatever it is that they're doing? That's a successful individual. Yeah. Not a successful business, not a successful job. That's a successful individual. You throw yeah. them in the woods, they'll come out, you know, lead in the pack. Th that's why I think we see these Powerball winners, right? There was a guy in your state, Michigan, years ago, won $300 million. And like and three weeks broke. later, what's that? They go broke, right? Yeah. He, they caught him driving across the border from Mexico with like 80 kilos of cocaine in an RV because he didn't know what to do with his life. He had bought all the samurai swords on planet Earth, samurai swords and cocaine, right? He, he had Maybe the money. cocaine was his passion. <laughs> I, I guess so. Maybe he had a challenge there. But yeah, that's why these people that win that money go broke and they're never happy. I don't want to say never, right? But most of the time, they're not that happy because they, they haven't found something to where they can work at it, where they can get better. Um, I'm not, don't get me twisted. There's that camp of people that's like, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Screw that. It's the about journey, the, the journey is the destination. Yeah. It's, it's about the destination. Like yeah. I want to get to where I'm going. I don't want to just journey around going nowhere, bumping into stuff. But at the same time, there is in that struggle, there's a lot of value. there. Yeah. So we're at what my last thing. Yeah. Hit me. So my last thing, my third thing would be prospecting like a lion, right? Love that. Land, air, and sea. Text, email, voicemails, flyers, dinners, events, social media, because you never know what kind of learner you have or what kind of client you have or what kind of prospect you have until you understand the way they learn, right? I don't know mm -hmm. if you're a visual learner. I don't know if you're a kinesthetic learner. You know, kinesthetic, you got to do something to learn. Right. I don't know if you have to hear something to learn. And I don't know if you have to see something to learn. So if you can't learn what type of learner somebody is, then you try to hit them with all three types of learning until it latches on and you agree with something or we go deeper in something. I say, you know what? Matt really liked that photo I sent him. Maybe you're a visual mm -hmm. learner. Mm -hmm. So I always try to attract all three types of learners when speaking. Make yeah. them hear what you're talking about. Make them see what you're talking about. Make them feel what you're talking about. Right. You know, the worst teachers or the worst coaches or the worst leaders are the ones that only teach things writing on the board. It's all visual. There's never any videos. There's never any listening. There's never any experimenting. Right. Or a yeah. teacher that does everything video and audio. You know, that's a problem with the virtual schools when everything was just video and audio. Well, the students that have to do things on their own to learn are not learning now. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm hmm. The students you, have to see it. Yeah. So I feel you like I made that number one. And why I think you should have made that number one is there's one problem that every business on this planet has. Every salesperson on this planet has. We all have the same problem is you can boil it down to one thing. And that is people don't know us. And that's why I think prospecting should have been your number one, because here's the thing. And you, and you mentioned like, hey, people got to like you, but if they don't know you, they can't like you and they can't trust you. And this is, it breaks my heart when people oh. don't focus on prospecting because if there's only four people that I'm reaching out to in my pipeline, like, and by the way, if you want to remove stress from your sales career, if you are like I used to be waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, have 3000 deals going in your, I, you, you heard me correctly. And I have salespeople that work for me, me personally in my sales pipeline. I have over 3,000 
deals because I understand that prospecting is super important. And if you don't know who Matt Easton is, you can't buy from me, right? And I could screw up everything else, but at least I'll have a shot at your business, right? So I love that you said prospecting. That's something I'm huge passionate the, about. The reason why I get put the it third, Matt, is because I do have conversations with people for 30 minutes or one hour, or I do have meetings with people for 30 minutes, or one hour where I do establish a relationship and I walk out where they like me and I like them. There is a relationship established. Yeah, so but that had to start in- with you making that initial connection. And that's where your prospecting comes in and is paying dividends for you. Correct. When I said prospecting, I meant more like follow-up, like after the first, after the first interaction, what you do, Mm. which is why it's third. Now, if me and you both send messages, emails, phone calls, voicemails, flyers, the same amount of time for the same amount of people, then how do I figure out who's better? I look at whose flyer is more attractive, whose email is more creative, whose text had more content in it, whose voicemail sounded more energetic. But I say, use all your resources that you have and then master the content inside those resources. So you make sure if anybody else sits in Matt Easton's desk today, they can't do a better job than Matt Easton because he threw the kitchen sink at it. Right. Keep throwing that kitchen sink too. If you can get half the people in the country to hate you, you'll be president, right? Like they'll all know you. Right. Totally. Totally. Just do do it. Yeah. You got it. Well, listen, man, it was great having you today. Yeah, it was great to be I here. Thanks so it. much, Ace. Connect more. Matt Easton, always a pleasure, my brother. Ace, I love you, my brother. Whatever you need, I'm always here for you. Thank you so much for having me. I love you too, man. Let me stop this recording real quick. Awesome.